All right, I wanted to say a couple of words before I get started with Robert, and, um, and I, I, I just want to say um, that uh, there are a few people in the magazine business whose names we all know. Anna Wintour, Tina Brown, Graydon Carter. There are others. Oftentimes, those others are editors. And then there are a few people in the magazine business whose names we all should know. These are the people who make magazines what they are, the photographers, the designers, the writers. I would argue, mainly the writers. <laughs> At their heart, the best magazines are about story. And while we talk a lot these days about different ways to tell stories, there is still one elemental way, a method that binds one generation to the next, through the millennia, all the way back to the Bible and before, and that way is with words. Words transport us while allowing our imagination to take wing. In the light of his Apple monitor, Jacobson's grin took on a Luciferian glow. That's from a Robert Draper story. From a different story. Every afternoon, Muhammad goes to the lighthouse. It is not an obvious refuge. Built nearly a century ago, the Italian lighthouse has been in disuse for years. Its spiral staircase is in a state of mid-collapse. Its hollowed out room smell of sea rot and urine. Young men sit cross-legged in the rubble, chewing quat, a plant whose leaves contain a stimulant, and playing a dice game they call ladu for hours. Some huddle in a quarter, corner and smoke hashish. They seem like ghosts in a city left for dead. But the lighthouse is quiet and it is safe, if any place in Mogadishu can be considered safe. These are just two small examples from a long and distinguished body of work by someone whose name you should know, Robert Draper. Robert has written for Texas Monthly, GQ, National Geographic, The New York Times Magazine, Atlantic, Elle, The New Republic, and many, many other publications. He has authored Death Certain, a book about the George W. Bush presidency, Do Not Ask What Good We Do, about the Tea Party Congress, Rolling Stone Magazine, The Uncensored History, and a novel called Hadrian's Walls. He recently wrote the lead essay of the new National Geographic, Ge Geographic 125th anniversary issue. Here is just a tiny excerpt from it. I read it just yesterday and it knocked me out. I couldn't even really decide which passage to, to, uh, to include. By resting a precious particle of the world from time and space and holding it absolutely still, a great photograph can explode the totality of our world such that we never see it quite the same again. He goes on, today photography has become a global cacophony of free frames. Millions of pictures are uploaded every minute. Correspondingly, everyone is a subject and knows it. Any day now, we will be adding the unguarded moment to the endangered species list. It's on this hyper-egalitarian, quasi-Orwellian, all-too-camera-ready terra infirma that National Geographic's photographers continue to stand out. Why they do so is only partly explained by the innately personal choices which lens, for which lighting, for which moment, that help define a photographer's style. Instead, the very best of their images remind us that a photograph has the power to do infinitely more than document. It can transport us to unseen worlds. I guess photography can transport us as well. Um, those of you who have read him know that with words, Robert Draper deepens our knowledge of and appreciation for that endlessly complex thing we call the human condition. And that even includes photographers. It is my privilege to have known Robert for many years, and it is my honor to welcome him to Syracuse University. With that, I introduce to you Robert Draper. Thank you, Paul. So, all right, off we go. Um, Enough about you. Um, 
let's talk a little bit more about you, actually. Um, let's talk a little bit first. We're going to cover a lot of ground because Robert writes about politics. He writes about uh, travel. He, as I mentioned, uh, as you can pick up from, from the introduction, he writes for about a lot of different topics for a lot of different publications. Um, but first, I kind of want to go back in time and talk first about um, just some of the most basic sorts of things, how you first got into writing. Well, I, I mean, um, I, be, I decided I wanted to become a writer early on, not by process of el elimination, but because there was simply nothing else that I could do well. And, and uh, I mean, I, you know, the, the real estate was out of the question for me. I mean, I just, you know, I've, I, uh, I can't fix anything. Uh, and, and to the degree that I can figure out anything in the world, I figure it out sort of through the process of writing. Uh, I had encouragement at an early age from English teachers, but as, as um, you guys have likely already learned, you know, the, uh, um, the, those credits don't necessarily transfer to the next, you know, to the next university. And, and uh, um, at a certain point, um, you have to make a decision of, of uh, how to you know, um, transfer. And if you should transfer, um, your, you know, your, your juvenile you know, interest in the written word to an actual career. And, um, and it took, frankly, a while for me to do so. Uh, it took a while for me to find the career path. I, I at first just thought I wanted to write novels. And, and uh, in fact, you know, in my senior year in high school and freshman year in college wrote uh, a novel which thankfully was not published as this horrendous, you know, tortured adolescent um, a book that, that I, I can't bear to throw away any more than I can bear to read it. And, and, uh, can you tell but, us what it was about? Um, it, was, it was about me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, anyway, I, um, uh, and so after, after college, I, you know, uh, I managed a, a really cheesy rock and roll band. Um, I uh, worked at a, 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 a translation company, tr um, helping to translate technical documents. Um, and then my last honest job was uh, working for a guy in Austin, a local character named Jeffrey Nightbird, who was a urine entrepreneur. He, he, developed, <laughs> he developed synthetic drug-free um, urine, which, uh, which I would, as his urine lackey, pack into vials and then send out to like Marines who had to take a drug test the next day. And, and uh, I then, you know, at a certain point just decided this is what I was going to freelance. This is, I, I was going to establish myself as a writer. And I remember my first year writing for really anybody who would take me. Brides Magazine, meet, Meetings and Conventions Magazine, Music and Sound Output Magazine, you know, the magazines that, that would fold the moment I sent in the story or fold, you know, the moment the paycheck was to come in. Um, Local what? publications too, right? Yeah, yeah. The the Austin Chronicle, uh, 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 which is an arts and entertainment weekly. There is a monthly magazine, short lived, called Third Coast Magazine. Um, my first year, I think I made seventy five hundred dollars, and I thought, well, this is pretty lousy, but this is you know the bottom. It won't get any worse. The next year, I made like fifty three hundred dollars, and and uh, that was the year that you and I did the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission story that got killed, and and uh, and uh, uh, the and I, I ultimately took a chance um, and decided to write a book. Uh, uh, when Rolling Stone magazine celebrated its 20th history, uh, and um, uh, I had met a couple of people who you know as well who um, worked for the magazine. And they lived in town. They, they lived, lived in town, and I had a sense listening to them talk that if you sort of followed the, this magazine's tra uh, trajectory from this scruffy Summer of Love magazine from 1967 to when it moved to um, New York 10 years later, and then when it sort of joined the MTV you know, um, uh, pantheon, that, that you'd have a sense in that in that 20 year period of kind of how hippies became yuppies. And so I used the book as, a, as, as the, the, the magazine's history as a means of doing that. And, and uh, the book did well. And, and on the strength of that, uh, the magazine, um, the very good re regional magazine, Texas Monthly, which had made a, a, a side career out of rejecting all of my queries for previous years, um, finally decided I was worthy of writing for them. And since then, I've been writing for a living. Well, tell me about the Rolling Stone. How, you, here you were just writing for you know, publications that, that were closing. And yeah. as I recall, both of us uh, shared the pain of one particular closing where we didn't get paid for, yeah. for uh, uh, I believe it was Third Coast. And um, in any event, how were you able to, uh, as I recall, you, well, not as I recall, in fact, you uh, were able to interview the very top people, including Jan Wenner at Rolling Stone, and here's this guy that, you know, right. for all intents and purposes, nobody's ever heard of. Well, how, did, yeah. how did you do that? The Rolling Stone book was kind of an object lesson, and, and you know, two, 
you know, the kind of parallel realities that take place throughout one's journalism career. One is, you know, that, um, uh, um, you know, occasionally you're, uh, you're the um, beneficiary of dumb luck, and, and the other is that, you know, the, um, that the luck is the residue of, uh, of, of the hard work. In this particular case, um, uh, the th uh, I, I wish I could say the thought had occurred to me that writing a book whose principal characters were journalists um, would put the wind in my back because journalists would be sympathetic towards me. That thought only occurred to me like midway, but, it, but in fact, uh, I, you know, I had all these people who were willing to cut some slack to a freelance journalist who had no background to speak of. It was only after interviewing all of them, though, that Jan Wenner, who at first was being steadfast not only in his avoidance of me, but trying to obstruct the book, um, then agreed uh, through a painstaking um, process to ultimately do a series of interviews with me. And ultimately he was very unhappy with the book and tried to sue me and, and uh, put out a restraining order on the book, which only sort of helped the notoriety of the book. And, and, uh, uh, but it was, it was really in the process of that year and a half long period that I sort of figured out how to do a narrative, which frankly was a word that I didn't, I, I didn't even know what that word was, I think, at the time that I, um, what it meant at the time I did the book, but, but basically how to tell a story through the process of like spending a year and a half inside that story and figuring out just what it was, and it, it, um, it had a natural chronology to it. And so in a lot of ways, um, it was, you know, the, it afforded me this kind of self-taught experience of how to do what I now do for a living. How did he try to obstruct? He, um, uh, in, in, in ways great and small um, and insidious and overt, he, uh, uh, I remember when I sent him a letter and told him I wanted to do this um, uh, this book, he wrote back, and I know he did this on purpose, it's a, it's a dear Mr. Drape, you know, left off the R, dear Mr. Drape, you know, and, and, uh, and said I, you know, that, that ultimately, I, yes, I have heard something about this, this little project of yours, and I, and I probably will not cooperate, uh, but um, I'll be keeping an eye on you, and, 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 uh, and certain, you know, there were certain people who told me not to talk to, but then there were people who talked to me anyway and would go to him and say, you know, Jan, you really should talk to this, you know, guy. He, he seems to be trying really hard and, and seems furthermore to know what he's up to. Jan, at a certain point, um, um, had a long uh, uh, evening um, uh, getting drunk with him at his, at his place and he, it was all off the record and he was negotiating with me. He asked me how much, he, he said he'd heard that, that I was paid $125,000 advance for the book, and he said, I will double that amount if you will drop your contract and write the book for me. And so he was bribing me, and I, and I was you know, so drunk that I, that I like, was operating on instincts and, and just said, absolutely not. I mean, I knew he was a liar, and otherwise I might have like, calculated 250 <laughs> and and, uh, uh, and, um, and then uh, he later offered uh, a bunch of photographs um, from the magazine's personal archive, which when he managed to get a rough copy of the, uh, of the book, he then, with held and then slapped us with a temporary restraining order, but through, lit through a kind of legal machinations, we made clear to him that there's a lot that I'd left out of the book that should this go to court um, would all be trotted out in court having to do with his sexual malfeasances and stuff like that, and so ultimately he, he dropped any sort of legal action. Because um, this is a magazine program, I'm gonna, and this was you know a, a major book that you wrote about a, a very significant publication. I'm going to stay on this just for a couple of minutes, um, and then we'll move into something else. But on, on Rolling Stone, um, you interviewed some of the most famous names that have ever written for Rolling Stone. Yeah. Among those, um, and some, not everybody in here, believe it or not, may not know who uh, uh, um, Hunter S. Thompson is. One you're likely to know, yes, Hunter S. Thompson, though even his name has you know, sort of faded to gray, I think. But he was the you know, self-styled gonzo journalist. And, and in the 1970s um, in particular, though also in the late 1960s, he was part of a movement that really began with, with Gay Talese and Tom Wolfe and, and others who were injecting... Um, into journalism, kind of fictional techniques of writing, and um, such that um, uh, some of it was, you know, the shifting of scenes and, and the use of hyperbole. In Hunter's case, it was also, um, uh, in, you know, in, inventing dialogue, placing himself in the center of the story, and basically uh, fueling every single narrative of his with lots of drugs. And, and uh, his books, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and Fear and Loathing in the Campaign Trail of 1972, are like the, the classic cases in point. But Hunter was a, a real a, a crucial source for my book and became actually, in the end, a good friend. I, um, uh, and, uh, but he was a guy who, you know, 
Rolling Stone, I mean, today, for those of you, you know, who aren't aware of it, I mean, it, um, it's easy to look at Rolling Stone and it's yet, yet another magazine. It's a music magazine, but almost every magazine these days publishes something about music. There was a time in the late 60s and the early 70s when no one did. And, and uh, taking rock and roll seriously was a crazy proposition. And, but uh, that's precisely what Rolling Stone did. And they covered it just like they would cover any other journalism story. And sometimes passionately, sometimes dispassionately, but always seriously. And, and, uh, and in a lot of ways, they, they, you know, they, um, they, they put Rolling Stone on the map as a kind of um, uh, a legitimate culture and not just a counterculture. Uh, and Jan, was very, Jan Wenner, the editor and publisher, was very much responsible for that. But it was also, um, in its own ways, kind of a corrupt magazine in that uh, Jan would you know, uh, uh, um, bestow uh, great reviews to, to musicians he loved or wanted to meet. And, and he basically started Rolling Stone so he could hang out with Mick Jagger and John Lennon. And, and, uh, uh, and it became sort of his groupie vehicle. And, and, and so the book very much traces that. And it traces as well you know, the kind of precarious way in which a magazine um, uh, uh, you know, tries to stay true to its, um, you know, to its 1960s vibe, uh, and to its authenticity, uh, while at the same time being a commercial success, uh, and yet without being the dreaded words back then a sellout. And uh, many people consider Rolling Stone a sellout, or did back then. Today, the word scarcely exists. Right. Any war stories you should care to share about? Uh, okay. <laughs> we'll leave that for another time. Um, what do you think it's uh, Rolling Stone's legacy is? Um, I mean, it seems to me like they're doing better stuff now in the last few yeah, years. Yeah, they, they are. And, and uh, you know, the, um, the Boston Bomber um, uh, cover story, you know, is a reminder that, uh, um, that Rolling Stone can still sort of, you know, seize the spotlight uh, and create controversy, and very deliberately. You know, that, that, was, that was not a mistake that they did this sort of boy-next-door photograph of, of Snar, uh, Snarznayev. And, 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 um, uh, and for that matter, you know, the, the, um, uh, uh, they, no, they've broken a lot of stories in, in, uh, relating to politics, relating to the military. Um, their legacy, though, I mean, I, I, they're, they're one of many magazines that's capable of doing really great um, uh, journalism, but I think their legacy will still be that they legitimize, you know, rock and roll as um, as a, a, a subject matter to take seriously. Uh, which now, you know, every, it's axiomatic that every magazine does so, and and uh, uh, and has thus chiseled away at Rolling Stone's brand. But it was their brand. What's it like to write for different publications with their different voices? Well, I, you know, I very deliberately do that, um, partly because I. Um, I still have kind of the a you know struggling freelancer's distrust that um, that uh, that any magazine is going to be you know um, the a nice little nest egg for me you know that I mean I you know editors come and go and and, and and new editors that come in have the prerogative to you know fire everybody in sight and though that hasn't happened to me I'm, I remain you know ever vigilant towards that possibility. But the other is that uh, um, I, uh, different magazines are a tonic for each other. You know, I, I principally I divide my magazine writing career into principally into two magazines: the New York Times Magazine, where I write domestic politics, and National Geographic, where I do sort of you know global issues. B um, but you know, I've um, uh, in recent years, you know, uh, just by you know luck of having a decent reputation as a journalist, um, I. Get a lot of opportunities, and I and I tend to avail myself of them. I mean, I was I actually made a list of the um, on the plane up here. I was kind of curious to what I've done this year, and it's like a crazy year for me. I, I, uh, um, I by the end of this year, will have published 14 stories, and and uh, two of them um, in the New Republic. Uh, one of them about um, a military intelligence story, another a political profile about this congressman Chris Van Hollen. Um, a story from my old magazine, Texas Monthly, about the resurgence of Wendy Davis and the Texas Democrats. Um, three stories for National Geographic. Um, four stories for the New York Times Magazine. Um, two travel stories, actually, for the Sunday travel section of the uh, of the New York Times, and um, a story for L that was actually an, an essay. Uh, and then um, I'm reviewing a really crappy book for the Wall Street Journal right now. Uh, so you know, it's a. Uh, it's I've, I you know and I um, it's that's a that's a, a lot of production for me and um, but I have to admit it's it's really um, 
it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to work with different editors, to work in different, I mean, of those, you know, some, one of them is a personal essay, one of them is, uh, you know, the essay about photography that, that you were reading from. Um, a couple of them are political profiles, a couple of them I guess you could call narratives, one or two, investigative stories. And uh, what I've found is that, you know, the, um, I'm not very likely, I'm certainly not going to be, I, I like writing about domestic politics for the New York Times Magazine. If I were writing only about politics, I would open a vein, you know, I mean, it's just, it's such a disconcerting thing to write about at times, and, and, uh, uh, and um, I've, I, I really love writing for National Geographic, but it's a real hard on one's life to do these stories where you are overseas for one month at a time. I mean, in the month of November, I'll be, the, pretty much the entire month, I'll be on a boat going up the Congo River, and it'll be an interesting experience while I'm there. It'll be an interesting experience to tell people about, but it's also hard. It's hard on your personal life and all, and so I, I, I can't live by that alone. And so in a lot of ways, you know, each of these is, is sort of a, you know, the, um, uh, you know, a reflection of, of um, uh, a varied interest of mine, um, uh, none of which, though, you know, I, I'd want to devote myself to 100%. And I think, frankly, that, that uh, you know, the, um, the, the reality in magazine journalists, uh, journalism is there are very few gigs available um, in, uh, where you work full time for one magazine. I did that for a, for a long time for Texas Monthly and then a long time for GQ. And, uh, and I prefer the sort of dabbling approach. Oh, we're going to talk a little bit about politics and a little bit about travel writing. Um, and then I'm going to open it up here pretty soon. Let's talk, we've got pretty extraordinary circumstances going on right now in Washington, D.C. Um, with uh, Ted uh, Cruz up and, you know, um, I, I, I don't even know what he's doing. Actually, yeah, well, he's, uh, do you think he knows what he's doing? What is he talk. doing? Well, he's yeah, getting a lot of attention. He's if he's if um if if what he's I mean his, his game is the 2016 presidential sweepstakes. He's gotten you know the kind of publicity you know. Uh, no, I guess we I should just say suggest to, uh, we should say what he's uh, I think what his. Ultimate goal is, is to defund Obamacare. Yeah, so, I mean, Ted Cruz, for those who don't know, is the junior senator of Texas. He was just elected in 2012. He'd never been a politician before. He ran, a, he'd been a solicitor general um, uh, in uh, the state of Texas and um, uh, ran against uh, a, uh, an establishment Republican, the guy who was the lieutenant governor of Texas. Nobody gave Cruz a chance except for the Tea Party, which backed Cruz. And, uh, and Cruz just, you know, went way to the right of this guy, the, the establishment candidate. Uh, one, um, now joined the world's greatest deliberative body of 100 senators, and it's sort of the axiom in the Senate that, you, you know, you're, you're there to be seen and not heard for, let's say, you know, you're, you just kind of incubate for about, you know, 24 years or something, and then finally when you're 70, you can say something. And, and, uh, but Cruz, at, you know, 42 and, and three months into it, already started making a pest of himself, um, and not just to Democrats, but to Republicans as well. Where we are right now, you know, in the state of politics is that, um, because uh, Congress can't agree on an actual budget, we're having to fund government operations through these things called CRs. They're continuing resolutions, and they and they're short-term things. And the 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 Senate's controlled by the Democrats. The House is controlled by the Republicans. That the Republicans control only one thing, since the Democrats also control the executive branch where Obama sits, and and that's the House. And so um, they use whatever leverage they can, and so they uh, to to um, cut spending and in other ways kind of fulfill their conservative agenda. And so that's what they've been doing, these continuing resolutions, but they're, they're sort of right wing, dominated by these Tea Party guys, have insisted that uh, Obamacare be defunded. This is the 42nd attempt they're now making to do so. And um, they may, they're going to keep trying until they get it right, I guess. And, and, uh, but Ted Cruz from the Senate is, has really come up with this idea of, of, um, of uh, tying this continuing resolution to the defunding of Obamacare. And yet, um, once that passed and it occurred to Cruz that actually the Senate Majority Leader, who's a Democrat of the Senate, has the capabilities to strip that provision, the defunding prov provision, out of the continuing resolution, then Cruz decided he didn't want that bill to be passed after all and was going to try to filibuster it and 
and this this um, this led to this. Which is not really a filibuster. It's not, you know, no, it was yeah. a twenty-hour monologue or so, but I must say it was fairly impressive. I mean, I you know just in terms of like the sheer windiness of the guy, and <laughs> and, uh, and you know, I mean, I stayed up till eleven thirty or so, and and he was talking away, and I woke up at about four thirty or five this morning, and and uh, the man was still talking, and and uh, more or less in you know complete paragraphs, and and uh, uh, but to to what end? Um, difficult to say. You have written a lot about Republicans. You've written about John McCain. You've written about Sarah Palin. You've written uh, when the Tea Party comes to town. The uh, the book that you did. Uh, you wrote, of course, about George W. Bush. Um, why Republicans, not Democrats? Well, or why Republicans and not also Democrats? Well, in a way, yeah. sort of, it's kind of a path of least resistance. You know that that uh, I mean, I've, I um, I. I'd say it all began with me writing about George W. Bush, who had been the um, the governor of, of the state of Texas where I had lived, and um, and a long story, I'd really kind of a seminal story that I'd written about him when he was just about to run for president that I wrote for GQ, in which I had a lot of access to him and the world around him, uh, kind of you know d created an on ramp for me then to do a book about him, and after that, and along the way, I developed all these sources that were Republican sources, and and so. Um, I uh, kind of one thing led to another in that sense, but at the same time, you know, I mean, this just in, you know, the the uh, the media has a, a reputation for being to the left of center, and 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 I frankly think there's some truth to that. Less so about reporters, and more I think with editors. But um, but at the New York Times Magazine, I've had particular value because I I think that they they have not had a, a writer who has the kind of context and the kind of credibility amongst Republicans that I do because I think that to the extent that I have a brand that is that you know I'm 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 non-judgmental I'm fair I don't I'm not a polemicist I don't rop, write op eds or blogs and and uh, uh, and so um, uh, and so, yeah, I've, I've become kind of the Republican explainer to um, the New York Times' you know, liberal readership, I suppose. Um, your book on George W. Bush, um, you sat down six times yeah. with him? Yeah, six um, one-hour interviews. What's your, what, what's your takeaway um, 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 of George Bush? We have this, you know, of course there's a sense that he's either a simpleton or a villain or both. Um, got well, us into and, Iraq. And that sense and, has kind of... You know, changed over time, right? I mean, as, as as these senses of presidents tend to do. I mean, it's a uh, for one thing. He's you know, Bush was beloved amongst Republicans, and now is practically vilified. I mean, it's, you, you'll find more people who will speak poorly of Bush in, among Republicans, I think, than among Democrats who will say at least this was a guy who believed in activist government, who believed that there was a federal role for education, who in, expanded Medicare entitlements to senior citizens. Uh, uh, now, you know, he had his foreign misadventures, and he didn't pay for you know things like um, the war is and and uh, and you know Medicare for seniors, uh, and this is what's caused you know, Republicans to be so angry about him. But my take then, and it remains the case now, is that Bush was a lot smarter guy than people gave him credit for. He actually, on those subjects that interested him, had a really you know, aggressive intellect. I mean, such that if you got into an argument with him about something that he cared about, be it education, or later when he finally got engaged with Iraq, um, uh, he really knew his stuff and, and he could really bring it and correspondingly could really tear you apart if you didn't. And he has a, a great facility for finding the weak link in an argument and, and I'd hear that time and again from people who worked from him. Um, I experienced it myself in, in interviews I had with him. Um, the problem with, with Bush is that, um, was that he um, uh, he could be intellectually lazy, which is different from being unintelligent. I mean, he's an intelligent guy who um, uh, who just tended to get disengaged, and as a result of that, uh, he farmed um, large chunks of his presidency out to his vice president, Dick Cheney, and uh, and um, you know things like 9/11. I mean, it's 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 you know said over and over that President Bush kept us safe, and perhaps you know one should add, well. You know, after September 11th, he kept us safe, but but uh, but the reality is there were plenty of signs coming about Al Qaeda and, a, and, and an attack forthcoming in the United States, and he and he was disengaged throughout that, as he was with Katrina. And I think that's a that's something that you that's kind of a through line in all of Bush's uh, life, not just his presidency. So I found it in a lot of ways in the in, in the respect that all presidents are are complicated to be a far more interesting and complex character than than people than, than the caricature would have you believe about him. I'm going to do just a little word association with. With, um, with some of the people that you've interviewed. Um, so just do a little free association with a couple of these folks. Sarah Palin. Um, seat of the pants. Oh. John McCain. Uh, 
fiery. George Bush? Disengaged. <laughs> Joe Biden? Um, diarrhea of the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Congress? Uh, dysfunctional. Republicans? Uh, dysfunctional. Democrats. <laughs> Minority. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, I'm just going to ask you one or two more quick things on politics. We're going to move to travel, and then I'm going to open it up. And the thing on politics is it's a little Washington, D.C. parlor game. Um, Robert lives in Washington. Sitting here now, not, won't be hold, held accountable at all for what you're about to say. Who do you think will be the Democratic candidate and the Republican candidate for president? Well, I think Hillary Clinton's going to run, and if she runs, she'll be the nominee. And I mean, I, I, it's hard to say whether Joe Biden will run against her, but, I, but it's hard to foresee any circumstances under which, if Hillary chooses to run, and I believe I don't have inside information right. any more than anybody else does. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people in Hillary world and Obama world and all that, but they certainly all think she's going to run, and if so, I think she'll be the nominee. As to who uh, her opponent would be, um, you know, there are a lot of sort of, it's kind of an interesting field, but I think there are two looming characters, and those are Marco Rubio and Chris Christie. Um, uh, Rubio will not run if Jeb Bush runs, but I think that Jeb Bush is not going to run. He's in, and uh, um, uh, <coughs> Rubio was, was uh, a protege of Bush's when he was, um, uh, when he was head of the Senate and Bush was governor. Uh, and uh, so he feels very sort of beholden to Jeb. Uh, um, Chris, you know, to me, you know, the, um, the, the Republicans have a, you know, a riddle they have to solve. On the one hand, they, they have to keep their base interested, but on the other, they have to expand, you know, what, what really is a dying, you know, a, a shrinking base and respond to the new demographic challenges. Um, what that means, though, is that you know the, this kind of tightrope walk that you see Marco Rubio doing, you know, in a way that's anguishing. I mean, a, a guy who you know is afraid, you know, uh, you know, the moment he goes to the center with an immigration reform thing, then immediately moves to the right, you know, that's on on uh, other things relating to uh, say um, uh, the gun legislation and and now Obamacare. Um, Chris Christie would seem, you know, as a blue state um, uh, governor to be a really appealing prospect on top of which he has, you know, this, I think, you know, he has kind of the, the reek of authenticity to him, you know, and, and, and at a time when, when maybe a lot of people are disillusioned with Obama, uh, for, you know, let's say in the center, um, and uh, even in the left, um, that uh, this guy for all this bluster, you know, may, um, uh, you know, may really have what it takes. The, the open question is, you know, how that will play in the early conservative right. primaries of Iowa, uh, which is a caucus state, and, and then South Carolina, um, which traditionally move like everybody to the right. If, if Christie can remain who he is and withstand that, even coming in second or third, but still you know, not self-emulating, um, then maybe that will serve him in good stead and states down the line and ultimately you know, to his brand overall come the general election. Um, we don't know, you know, because he's never run the gauntlet of, of these primaries, whether he'll do just like every other, you know, sort of craven Republican candidate and, and, and uh, you know, do whatever it, it, it seems to take, which means moving to the right to win one of these early primaries. If so, it's going to hurt him in the general election just like anybody else. Now, let's talk a little bit about travel writing. Um, in National Geographic, you've uh, been to Somalia. You wrote a recent essay about what occurred there in, in Somalia, and it's, it's a pretty you know, harrowing experience that you had. And actually, I remember when you first got back from Somalia, you and I went out, and you were really shaken up by yeah. Somalia. Um, I guess first, let me ask you a little bit, for those who haven't had an opportunity to read your story about Somalia, tell me a little bit about what it was, how it was that you even ended up going to Somalia. This is not a typical, you think of travel writing and you think of you know luxurious uh, hotels in the south of France and you think of wonderful cruises and whatnot. Uh, how did you end up going to Somalia? Well, yeah, let's make this clear. You know, I, I do a lot of stories for National Geographic and none of those are sort of luxury travel stories. They're all pretty rough and, and somewhere along Along the way, the editors of National Geographic developed the totally mistaken impression that I'm fearless, you know, and, and uh, that began with the Somalia story, which I did not, you know, it wasn't my idea to do the story. The photographer, Pascal Maitre, um, who won the National Magazine Award in photojournalism for that story, and who's a wonderful guy, a great photographer, and who I've worked with now in five or six stories, um, had been to Somalia many times, and, uh, and I, um, when I heard 
about the story, I decided I wanted to do it because I'd never been to a truly failed state before. I mean, this is a country where like 17 iterations of government have, have, have stood up and then collapsed, you know, um, over a period of 20, 23 years. And, and, uh, um, and, and so it was the first of really dangerous stories that I would do that would also later include um, a story on poppy farmers in Afghanistan, a story on um, the militias and uh, the genocidalists in the eastern Congo, um, Madagascar after the collapse of the government, uh, and, um, and Libya uh, two months before Chris Stevens was shot. And, and in each of those I spent a, about a month or so. But the Somalia story, um, I spent only uh, uh, for 15 days, something like that. We intended to stay longer, but um, um, and, and I remember in Nairobi, right before, um, we flew from Nairobi into Mogadishu, and I remember the day before when Pascal and I were in Nairobi, we met with Doctors Without Borders. These guys, they'd just come in from Mogadishu. They had pulled up stakes. They were the last non-governmental organization from the West, the last NGO, to get out, get, to get out of Dodge. And they met with, with me and they said, there's no point in you going, it's too dangerous. You know, you'll just be dodging bullets the entire time. You won't be able to get out of your hotel room. If you, you, know, if you go anywhere, you'll be kidnapped or killed. And I went back to Pascal and said to him, man, I don't think we should go tomorrow. And he said, no, no, it is no problem. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, so, so we, you know, we went and, and, um, and the first, you know, it's, 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 um, uh, it's nerve wracking to go to a country like that where you show up in the airport and you know, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of people there and there are only two Anglos and those were us two. We were in fact not only the only two Western reporters um, in all of Somalia. We were the only two Westerners, period, other than maybe one or two um, spies. And even then, I, I'm not sure about that because um, the CIA and FBI had no assets in Somalia. I know this because after I got back, they came to interview me to ask me what I knew about Somalia. And, and, um, but, uh, uh, but while we were there, a new round of, of, of um, killing began. Uh, um, uh, at that time, Mogadishu was almost entirely controlled by al-Shabaab, um, which has re-entered the news uh, uh, due to the tragedy in the Nairobi shopping mall, uh, this extremist Muslim group. I interviewed, in fact, uh, one of the lieutenants of al-Shabaab in Mogadishu. It's uh, uh, our, our fixer, um, who is a guide slash interpreter, but really in a lot of ways is the guy who, uh, who knows the lay of the land, is the most crucial person you'll hire on when you do these foreign stories. Um, played both sides. He, he, he got along well with the extremists, he got along well with the government, and, and he, it, before we arrived he had to convince um, al-Shabaab that we were not spies because usually Western journalists got in and got out in like two or three days and we wanted to stay for a few weeks and, and so they were convinced that we were spies and they were going to target us for assassination and, and it took, a, took quite some time before they, they settled down from that and said we won't do that, we'll, um, we, but every day is a new day and you'll have to check in with us to let us know, you know we, we can't vouch for the safety of certain areas and, and, and I, I almost never on National Geographic assignments, even in very dangerous places, go with bodyguards because you can't interview people when you're surrounded by people with guns. In Mogadishu, though, there was really no choice. I mean, I, I had you know seven or eight members of security with us wherever Pascal and I went, uh, and um, nonetheless, I mean, we went you know all around Mogadishu and and, and on its outskirts and and uh, and got a, a real sense of of. Um, of the city, which was once a beautiful city laid out by the Italians and, and uh, really a, 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 a glorious city, though a shell of that. Um, about a week into our being there, two freelancers showed up to town, two other Westerners, and they had no experience whatsoever and really should not have been there. And, and the one They were was, young, right? The they were very young, yeah, a guy who was from Australia and a woman who was from Canada. And the woman was clearly the one in charge. Amanda Lindhout was her name, and Amanda said, you know, the, the, when she showed up, I, I, show me where the bombings were taking place. I, I, she was, wanted to get TV footage, and, and, you know, they, and I just, I remember writing my then-girlfriend an email that evening saying, you know, trouble has arrived and she's going to get one of us killed. And, and uh, what happened, though, was that um, uh, the head of our security sold Pascal and me out to a militia. And, um, uh, and on a day that we were going to travel 100 miles south of, of Mogadishu, um, this, the, the head of our security had told this militia in that area, um, these guys are going to come this way and, um, and I'll tell you where they'll be because he was going to be driving one of our two cars. 
And, uh, but just before we left, our fixer decided to add a couple more members of security. And it would have been a shootout as a result. And so the head of our security, unbeknownst to us, who was in the car ahead of us, called him and said, no, don't, all bets are off. These guys have too much security. However, these two, free, these two other Western journalists are in a car behind them um, for a few miles. They're going to go elsewhere. And here's where they'll be, and you should go for them. So. Um, as it turned out, through no fault of their own, really through our fault, uh, those two uh, Westerners were kidnapped instead of us um, and held for a year and a half. Um, and uh, Amanda's um, book, uh, which just came out two or three weeks ago, A House in the Sky, is an incredible book, uh, co-written by Sarah Corbett of the uh, New York Times Magazine. And it's a bestseller already, and, and uh, I really recommend it. As some terrible things befell her. And, and uh, when, when we learned that they had been kidnapped, Word got out that we were there too. You know that we were there too, and and we had to hide out in a safe house and couldn't go back on the road and had to hire a militia to drive us along um, the Indian Ocean uh, back to the airport. And it was yeah, the, certainly the most harrowing um, forty eight hours of my life. Um, that story is, uh, is sort of in some ways even by the standards of whether it's National Geographic or that sort of journalism a little bit you know uh, of an outlier when you do a travel story be go to the Congo or Somalia or even if it's say to Italy or something when you do a travel story how do you prepare for that travel story well these are now there are what I'll answer to our say National Geographic travel stories because these are National Geographic is a magazine um, that invests a lot of money in its stories and so uh, they they tend to they um, they uh, they're not a timely magazine by any means and and uh, by any means I mean like stories that I mean there's a story that I wrote in March of 2011 that I think will be published in March of 2014. It's, you know, that's just tries to get freaking crazy at times. And it's and uh, they're the, the fastest turnaround they've done is on a story of mine that I that um, that will actually is a four month swing for them, which is really warp speed. I mean, they they haven't done that in 20 years. And so, um, but it's but for because um, that's not their strong suit. But instead, like doing a sort of definitive story with like lots of lavish photography, they they want you to go there and for a month at a time. So it's very important that you not spend time floundering about, that you hire someone on the ground who is an interpreter, who, who knows what you're doing, what they're doing. You do as much advance as you can. You don't, you, you. What do you mean by advance? Do you well, read I mean, a lot? Do you set up interviews? Yeah, what yeah. Like, well, for example, the, the, um, uh, the, the story I'm doing now, which, you know, about the Congo River, um, I've already been there once uh, in February. I was there for three weeks and then I'll go back and for three and a half weeks in November. And, um, but before I went, I, uh, Pascal and I read a lot on, on um, just historical stuff relating to the river, but also, you know, we hired uh, our interpreters slash fixers um, uh, through people we know. Uh, there's a, you know, Jeff Gettleman at the New York Times I know, and he's a wonderful foreign correspondent. Mm -hmm. He does Africa there, and so I, through him, have hired fixers uh, by his recommendation. And, um, um, but we've also, like, you know, tried to figure out a certain, you know, how do we want to do this story? I mean, in, in the first section of the story, we decided to be on a barge um, uh, because um, uh, um, the river is, um, it's, a, it's a commercial line where people move their goods from the uh, city to the villages and vice versa. And so um, uh, we spent three weeks on this um, uh, on this barge with like hundreds of other people who just sleep in tents uh, on there, so that so that we could sort of see um, these people and their way of life. It's a kind of becomes sort of a traveling city, um, but um, uh, but also there's this. Um, this interplay between uh, the village people and the city people and their goods and stuff, and and uh, so we had to like figure out which barge we wanted to be on, and you know, the, and uh, uh, um, and and there are all these crazy vagaries that can drive you nuts. But but you know, the, if the if um, it's not the rainy season, then the water is too low, and the and the boats you know tend to like drag and, and, and wreck almost all the time. And so um, and so there there are a host of logistical details that that you have to do. You you cannot. And I almost never do um, plan uh, in a travel story like who your characters are going to be. I mean, both in Mogadishu, but really in every story that I think I've written uh, in Geographic, other than, say, an archaeological story that involves me traveling to somewhere. I mean, I, I show up having a sense of what 
the, you know, what I, the kind of person I need as a vehicle to tell this story. But even then, I mean, you, you, you know, the, you, I, I, I do my best to like figure out where the places I should go, um, where the kinds of people that I should see. But um, like even when I was in Libya for a month, uh, you know, I, I wasn't really sure what was the story that needed to be told about Libya at that point. I had some sense that, you know, there, here's a country after Gaddafi, it's this, you know, trying to be a fledgling democracy, it's very unstable. Um, but I, until I was on the ground, I really didn't know what Libya was like. And, and to my great surprise, and, and this sort of flies in the face of the Western coverage since the tragic, you know, embassy bombing, I mean, I've, I've never been in a country in Africa where I've been more enthusiastically greeted as an American. And, and I've never been, never seen a Muslim country where people were so anxious and so enthusiastic about about um, uh, about embracing democratic ideals, and and uh, and so I needed for that to be a current to the story that that would be parallel to this current of instability, and the question would be sort of which would give first, and and but it's only you know that's um, and it's nerve wracking because you know that that um, uh, for these stories you're. Uh, sometimes you can be I like this Congo River thing. I'm going back twice, but usually it's like one month. That's that's it. Mm -hmm. So you really have to get it all then. And and if you come back and you say, yeah, I just couldn't find a main character, you know, that's your fault. And uh, and this is particularly the case. You know, I'm. I'm a contract writer with Geographic. I'm paid a salary in return for a certain number of stories a year. So I'm in effect an employee. To be a freelancer, you know, the onus is really on you. I mean, to produce, um, else you're not going to get another assignment. And um, so, um, those days when I am traveling are long, long days. I mean, there um, uh, there's no day off. I mean, they are they're um, the. The times that I'm not interviewing, I'm, I'm you know, reading and researching, I'm talking to the photographer who's there with me, you know, sort of discussing what the story is. Of course, I should say, you know, before I like, you know, wallow in too much self-pity the, the, about, you know, the, the hard work is that the photographers have these insane hours, you know, because they have to be there like before the sun is up and, and they have to take sundown pictures and they essentially work, you know, and then they have to the, download all their photos and, and uh, so they have like 20 hour days. And so um, I can't feel too much sympathy for myself. Well, I could talk to you more and more and more about all these things, travel and politics and whatnot, and I'd love to get into just some of the, I mean, we've talked a lot about some of the hard things. I'd love to talk to you a little bit about your love for Italy and how much you've traveled through Italy and your, uh, well, and what you've learned there about wine and about cooking and all that. But I really feel like it's about time that we should open things up for, for questions. And I think we've been keeping a Twitter feed. Um, so why don't we take a look and see if there's any questions there. But in the meantime, as we're looking to do that, if there are any questions here, this would be the time to start opening up, uh, opening things up to uh, questions. There's so many that I haven't asked. Um, so if you've got some, uh, I'd love to hear them. Who's got a question about writing or about travel or, well, let's see what we've got up here. All right. Here's one here. We've got some. Yes. How much on average do you write a day? Yeah, it's, it, well, for one thing, um, most of my days I'm not writing. You know, the, the, the reality for a journalist is that you spend a lot of time thinking of stories, a lot of time trying to get sources to talk. Uh, um, if you're, you know, um, in all likelihood, you have to spend a lot of time like transcribing your interview tapes, you know, which is really a heinous thing to do, but you just have to. And and uh, and and the reality is that you know a, a minority of my time is spent writing. But when I actually sit to write, and I think that's your question, um, I tend, you know, to I tend to outline my stories. So and, and as I'm like. Because I'm a magazine journalist rather than say a, a news reporter, I'm inside my story for quite a while. You know, the, in, in, upwards of anywhere from let's say three weeks to, in the case of one story I'm doing now, four or five months. And there's some stories that I string out for even longer than that. So I'm spending a lot of time, kind of you know, sort of wallowing in my story and 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 um, and thinking. You know, uh, you know, what's the beginning of my story? You know, what what exactly are the certain themes that I need to hit on in the story, such that um, I'm kind of pregnant with all this by the time I sit down and write. And for me, it works to um, write in long spates. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm. Um, uh, for all of my shortcomings as a writer, I tend, knock on wood, not to be afflicted by writer's block. And so I will usually write 12 hours a day. And uh, that's nonfiction. A fiction, you just can't do that. It's, a, I mean, it's like six hours and you're, you know, have brain fever. And, and uh, but, um, but I, I, 
I tend to write, I mean, uh, uh, you know, my first drafts I usually do over a period of five, six days. And those are, and I'm speaking of stories that are, you know, six, seven thousand words. I'm a pretty fast writer and I'm pretty good at concentrating. And those days are not pretty days. You know, I don't shave and I often don't bathe and I really, you know, look and smell awful. And, and you know, and I, and I like eat popcorn for breakfast and, and, uh, uh, and um, you know, I, it's a real Boo Radley kind of, you know, um, you know visual. And, and, uh, but I mean, that's, and then when I finish, it's a national holiday, you know, and, it's, and, then, and, and then like after like 12 hours of, you know, celebrating myself, then comes that, that gloomy feeling there, the feeling of foreboding when you know the editor's actually reading it and, and you have not yet heard the uh, Wow, this is the greatest story I've ever, you know, written, and and, and you, you know, it's like the the Grim Reaper is coming. So. <laughs> Are there? Do we have you noticed ahead, if we sorry. have any questions here? Uh, okay. uh, what about your books? How long did it take you to write those? That's um, it depends. Uh, um, I, I I and I tend to have a reporting period and a writing period. I really I have a lot of trouble doing both at the same time. Uh, but but it's it's not that dissimilar to magazine writing in that I really prefer to sit down in a concentrated period and do that. Now I have to say that, that um, um, some of that's been a function of like really harsh deadlines. Like the book I did on the House of Representatives um, had this crazy, I mean I basically got the contract to do the book in November of 2010, but a week after um, you know this Tea Party Congress got elected and the, the book was published in April 2012, and so I had you know 16 months to report and write this book, and or something like that, or and and uh, and it was it was really frenetic, and it's not though I think I pulled it off. It's not the ideal way to do the books. The one I'm working on now, I intend to luxuriate with and actually spend like a full year writing. It's um, though I may drive myself crazy with the slowness of that pace, and it may it may be like eight or nine months instead. And the question here. The biggest one is be absolutely prepared. Be under, be mindful of the fact that you are inconveniencing whoever it is you're interviewing. Almost uh, more often than not, um, they they are humoring you at best, or just flat out don't want to be interviewed. And so. Um, you, you're already imposing on their time, and, and you don't want to be that much of an imposition by asking them questions that have been asked to them a million times before, um, or, uh, or questions that just do not apply to them. So the, what I always do is um, read everything I possibly can that's been written about such a person. Um, uh, you know, be thinking really hard. I write out my questions in advance. Um, and, and I memorize them, essentially. I mean, I, so that when I come in, they're, they're still like written down, but I almost never refer to it. And, and part of that is because I'm, I'm, um, I actually have a pretty good memory, and so that's helpful. But it's also because, you know, you want uh, the, the whole, you know, what's the end game? The end game is to get people to reveal themselves or to reveal information. How do you do that? You do that by putting them at ease. How do you put them at ease? By making it feel like a kind of conversation and, and one in which, you know, that, that's even perhaps enjoyable to them. You know, that, um, but, but you have to be, you know, by enjoyable I mean, you know, you, um, you, uh, you, um, you make it clear without trying to be too much of a Mr. Smarty Boots that, 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 you, know, uh, that you know what you know and, and uh, that your questions are very you know, informed questions. And, um, but, that you're, but that you've also thought about this person, this interviewee, and what it is that you want to ask them such that it feels just like a, you know, a conversation that's primarily driven by an inquiring mind and a person who's going to you know, hand it over. I tend to... Um, uh, record almost all my interviews. There are some where I don't because it's clear that I'm not going to like quote them and, and also where the words are not as important as the information. Because I do a lot of politics interviews, there are all these gradations of interviews that I do. Some are on the record, some are on background, some are deep background, and some are off the record. And, and, uh, and I can explain all of that if you want or not. But it's, but, uh, um, and, and there are some of those where they, they'll ask that the tape recorder be turned off at certain junctures. Um, uh, usually I'll 
if they'll, there'll even be times at the beginning where they say they don't want it recorded and I'll put up a little bit of a fight with that saying that my handwriting is really lousy and I can't read my own writing, which is actually true, and that, and that I really you know, want to faithfully capture what it is that they've said. And, and, uh, but if it looks like that's a losing proposition, then you know, there's, no point in, uh, there's, there's no point in fighting it. And, uh, but I think you know, it's, it's principally um, you know, uh, understanding that you know, the clock is ticking and that, and, uh, and that you have to be respectful of their time. Um, organize. I organize my questions too in what will be a kind of conversational flow. You don't start with the hardest question that's going to be the, or, or the, the most off-putting question. Um, when I was doing a series of interviews with President George W. Bush, he didn't say, I'll give you six one-hour interviews. He, he said, I'll give you one interview and we'll see how it goes. The first interview was very tricky because for all I knew, he was going to pull the plug after one interview. Um, uh, so I didn't want it to be like nothing but fluff questions. On the other hand, if they were all hardball questions, that would guarantee there'd be only one interview. So I had to do this sort of balancing act, and I had to read him. And, and you often have to do this, and you, know, you have to improvise in the course of interviews. You get a sense that this person doesn't know all, all these things you were prepared to ask them about, but does know these other things. So this person is very uncomfortable about talking to these certain things. So it's a, you, have to, you, you have to be prepared, even as you, in a sense of scripted this, at least for me, you know, to, to, um, to depart even radically from your script, you know, that's uh, in, in the manner of any conversation. Other questions? I wondered if you would talk a little bit more about how you spend your time in the country on the ground, and then also how that compares to how photographers need to spend their time. Well, in National Geographic, I often travel with photographers. I'd say four out of five times I do, and, and I really enjoy that. They're great professionals and, and, uh, and frequently great guys. They're, they're, they're very exacting, and, and, and in the case of National Geographic, uh, photographers, they're real photojournalists. They think the story is important to them, you know, for the most part. And uh, nonetheless, there are times when our job descriptions diverge. And, <clears throat> and in some cases, if there is like a, you know, a, some dangerous situation, a militia or something, a one-shot deal, like when we went to interview the Al-Shabaab guy um, in Somalia, we weren't going to get two cracks at this guy, so we both went to that. But there are other times where um, I have to do a series of in-depth interviews that, that are not in any way photogenic, you know, and, and for that matter, other times when a photographer will have to spend, you know, the proverbial three or four days in a tree shooting a mountain gorilla, you know, and I, I sort of get it the, the first hour and, and can go. As for the time that, that, um, that I spend on the ground, I mean, a lot of it's improvisational, but, you, but um, I, I, um, uh, I mean, again, and this was particular, I think, to the experience of, of writing for National Geographic, where they afford you the opportunity to spend like a month, and they have the resources to do that, that, um, that it really is a full immersion process for me, you know, that I, that I spend every waking moment doing the interviews, uh, figuring out more interviews, transcribing the interviews that I'm doing so that the, the, all the material is still fresh in my mind, um, uh, you know, reading history books, talking to the photographer about things. Um, but, it's, but I also, um, uh, because in all likelihood, it's my only shot, unlike a domestic story, I have to be deciding kind of on the fly, you know, in real time, what is this story? And, and, it's, and that can be nerve-wracking because then you're having to decide, um, so if um, you know, the, uh, the story is this, then who are the characters who, you know, who are the kind of the vehicles for telling that story? And, um, and sometimes you can't find you know, that one exquisite character and, and, uh, uh, and you can do you know, a lot of flailing about. And uh, I've, uh, also, you know, they're, they're um, uh, the story can sometimes just change. I mean, I, uh, there, there are so many times that I've been on the ground and I've, and I've had a sense of, um, uh, of um, you know, like when I did a story on poppy farmers in Afghanistan, I you know, had this um, strong sense of, um, of how uh, Western aid was really you know, helping to eradicate poppy and all that. And then I started hanging out with these poppy farmers and I realized that was totally false and, and, uh, and, and, and had a sense in fact that, that, um, uh, that, uh, that Westerners had a lot of ways um, uh, 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 without meaning to perpetuated um, the, the production of poppy and thus you know, the opium sales that were being used by the Taliban against the West. And, and, uh, and so you, you know, you, um, 
it, it requires a lot of rigorous thinking of, of, uh, of, um, of what exactly is the material that I have, um, what does it say, is, uh, how does all this cohere into an actual story, is this the story worth telling as opposed to just the story I, you know, that's the easiest to tell, you know, it's, I mean, like you don't want to come away from a story about Libya talking about this one kind of cute little character when the story you have to talk about is, you know, the, the, the instability of this fledgling democracy and, uh, and so um, you're, you're constantly having to, uh, you know, to, to sort of balance um, the certain imperatives that are brought to you there to begin with, with, you know, what's practical, what's gettable. Mara, do we have any questions uh, on Twitter? I can't see from... They're mostly from comments. Yeah. Mostly comments? Yeah. Okay. Just a completely different subject. Yeah. Do you, did you think you could believe the Bush folks and the president? Well, you, the thing is you... I don't think you can believe anybody. I mean, I've, I've, you know, everybody's a liar. Every one of us, and and so I've, uh, I always. It's not that I assumed, you know, everybody's just, you know, talking out of their asses. Pardon my expression, but uh, but you know that that um, but that you you have to assume that people are not always reliable narrators. That people will sometimes um, uh, that. Um, they will deceive sometimes deliberately, sometimes not. Um, and uh, but in the case of the Bush people, you know, after a while, you you develop. I mean, in the way that the journalism is inherently a human enterprise, a certain amount of trust in certain people. You you get a sense that certain people are are are, are delivering the goods. You do it either because they're saying something that. Um, Maybe it's against their best interest, or doesn't you know that um, uh, doesn't uh, uh, in any way like aid and abet them to be telling you this or uh, something that has checked out repeatedly, uh, and uh, and you know that, I mean I had mentioned in Jim's class that I begin um, every every journalistic project in, in a state of total credulousness. You know I, I mean while I you know what is this okay. Um, so you were talking early on about how you uh, kind of figure things out through your writing. What was uh, one of the most important things you figured out by writing? I don't know. I have to write it down to figure it out. I think. And so, <laughs> um, I think you know that there. Are, uh, I mean, you know, just because we were talking about President Bush, you know, that one thing I realized about him that I think was not as clear to me until I was sort of I was coming upon the idea, but until I was wrestling with the words, I realized that Bush's virtues and vices were one and the same. That this guy who, who, uh, whose decisiveness. Um, you know, struck people as a kind of consistency of character about him was also, you know, his undoing because it could be, you know, his certitude. And that this is a guy who uh, related well to people because he wasn't like some, um, you know, the uh, kind of uh, ivory tower intellect by any means. Uh, but on the other hand, um, the, the, the flip side to that was that he could be intellectually lazy, that, that he wouldn't always do his homework. And, uh, and so, you know, and, I, and, I, and uh, that, of course, is, a, you know, a, an act axiom that I think rings true for most human beings, but, it, but, um, but I had to have all those facts sort of marshaled in front of me and then like figure out how I was going to write them before that truth sort of settled in. You had a question over here? Um, I really enjoyed your story on Tina Marie, the mother. Oh, wow. Daughter. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm just wondering how you secured that particular interview and how you get interviews from people that have no, there's no benefit from right. them. Well, the story that she's referring to is a story I wrote about a 23-year-old mother of two children um, who threw her children off a cliff. And um, she was... Uh, she was a Texas woman, and she was, um, uh, you know, understandably vilified in the press. You know, sort of this this demon mother, given like a 65-year sentence. And I, you know, I just had this fundamental question: What would lead a woman to do that? But I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in the most sincere and ignorant of ways, what what would do that? And and uh, and um, that's a story you almost can never do unless you can get the principal to talk. You know, they're, they're, uh, um, I think it's a dangerous thing, um, and, it, and it's a an unfortunate trend in magazine journalism where, where editors will insist that you get the principal person to agree to an interview before you'll uh, before the editor in turn will give you the assignment that that gives too much power to the the you know the that principal and and the reality is you know for most of them as you say there's there's it's not in their best interest to cooperate why should they and so it's usually usually they come around to it only after you've done all of this research and interviewed everyone else and it kind of creeps them out you know and they they feel like if they don't cooperate um, then, uh, then the story will reflect everyone's point of view but theirs. In the case of this young woman, Tina Marie Cornelius, 
her thing was um, she had she'd had a lousy attorney and got you know this very very long sentence. When in truth, the, the case against her was a little bit shaky and relied only on her confession. There was no physical evidence. A better attorney could have gotten her a much better deal. And she realized that only after she was imprisoned and and um, and you know after her sentencing, she wanted she I think you know was of the belief that a that a sympathetic story about her one that sort of told her side of the story might cause a parole board or something like that. I mean there was truthfully nothing technically that could be done for her. I didn't say that to her, but I also didn't make any promises to her. And, uh, but that was a very dramatic story and I, I did a series of I think four or five interviews with her, each one about uh, uh, one or two hours at a time where I'd go to this women's prison where she was and we and we talked about you know her life which was a very troubled life but then talked about her with her children. But you could feel us building up to what like the penultimate interview would be I guess and that was you know the interview the day that she snapped and, and, and threw her children off a cliff. But the, but the, the, the you know the the truth about her was that she had actually been you know a a very good mother a very good mother um, against considerable odds all the way up until the very day that she killed her children and that's a um, there is a you know uh, uh, there's a there's a particular phenomenon of, of women who kill their children, um, and and this is you know a, a consistency amongst most of them, and they feel such incredible guilt. Um, in a way that maybe fathers might not towards you know their their children if they kill them uh, that, that it's really intense and a lot of them and you know intend to commit suicide, so that was a very you know I, I, I like doing these kinds of stories I've done several of them and um, uh, uh, I'm sort of drawn to people who who are who are at first blush seem like monsters I mean frankly you know George W Bush is, is of that you know at the time that I did that um, the book um, you know the, there were so many people who hated him and by the time we published him and I think his approval writing was in the mid 20s and uh, but I, I, I I'm uncomfortable with caricatures, and I, and, and in fact, take a kind of glee in exploding them, and I, and uh, um, not just you know out of mischievousness or something, but because I think that it's important for us to view humans as humans. It's important for us to understand the dark side, why people are drawn, you know, to certain things. And, and uh, it's just as I interview a lot of powerful people, I'm interested in the frailty beneath the power, and I'm interested as well as sort of lending dignity to those people who otherwise might seem to be monsters. Sure. Sorry. Um, do you ever find that people yell at you for sympathizing? All the time, all the time, yeah, and it's and uh, yeah, lots of how how dare you and and uh, of course the Bush book. I mean, I all my friends to the left were really upset with that book, and and and, uh, and some of them remain so. And um, I don't care, you know. It's uh, uh, I, I, uh, and I I think that um, uh, it's um, now at the same time you have to be you have to be careful not to um, uh, to embrace the underdog to a degree that you lose all objectivity. I mean, the reality is, I mean, there's a story I did about this very notorious New York City cop named Justin Volpe, who uh, is serving, I think, a 25 or 30 year sentence for having uh, 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 this, this guy who allegedly hit him during the course of a riot of taking him back to a police station and shoving a baton stick up his rectum. And, and, uh, and, um, and he was one of the most notorious, you know, uh, abusive cops in New York history. But I did this story about him and about his family. And, and, uh, and it was, you know, a, a really long story that took me a year to do. But, you know, I, um, uh, it was as sympathetic as I could be towards them while at the same time, you know, capturing uh, inescapably the heinousness of that crime and his family remained upset with me over that they you know they they just still felt that he was such a good boy and all of this and and couldn't you know just felt that I needed to glide past that part and you know I could not um, we're nearing the end we could probably take one maybe two more yes. questions mm -hmm. yeah really okay. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask you a question about Italy and I may be butchering this pronunciation, but I've heard of a place in Fiuli called La Cifita, mm -hmm. and I wanted to know if you know anything about that? Well, I'll bet you know the answer to that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I will, in fact, be in La Subita in um, five days. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful 
place in, uh, to the east of, you know, to most American tourists, uh, the de facto eastern border of Italy is Venice. Nobody ever goes to the east of it, but there's like this beautiful region um, called Friuli Venezia Giulia, simply more, you know, the shortened form is Friuli. And it is bordered to the east by Slovenia, to the north by um, the Alps and Austria, to the southeast is uh, the Adriatic Ocean, and to me it is paradise, and the question about a diesel. And, and, uh, and, um, and uh, it's where the best white wine in Italy is made, uh, but they make really good red wine too. The food is terrific. But it's a beautiful sort of untrammeled area that, that American tourists tend you know, not to go to, and so you can actually go days without hearing the English language. and, and uh, um, uh, but they're very, very hospitable people. La Subita is this agritourism agri place. It's a Michelin star restaurant, so it's a very prestigious restaurant, but they also have these co cottages that are beautiful places to stay in. And I've, I, I lived there for four months at a time when I was working on a novel that I never published, but um, uh, that was in 2000 during the election. And I remember in my not so great at all Italian trying to explain to all these Italian winemaker friends I'd made, you know, why it is that this one guy in America gets the popular vote and this other guy, you know, uh, becomes the president of the United States. And, and, uh, uh, and uh, but anyway, no, it's, a, it's I've, I'd go there um, at least once a year. I've been going since 1996. And, and uh, uh, yeah, that's where I'll have my last meal, hopefully. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Robert. I really appreciate it. All righty. I'm in. Thank you.